cover story. This week, I caught up with Madeleine Albright, former U.S. Secretary of State, for an exclusive interview. She spoke to me about Modi's impending visit to the U.S. and also about some of the issues that could come up during a Modi-Obama meet. Also in cover story, we are going to be taking a look at previous Indian Prime Minister's visits to the United States and the kind of rapport they shared with the then American presidents. But first, take a look at the Madeleine Albright interview. Today we have with us former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, whom, as you know, served in the Clinton administration from 1997 to 2001. Until today, she remained the thought leader in understanding ge geopolitical strategy. Welcome to India, Mrs. Albright. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And your visit is very interesting, coming as it does on the heels of Prime Minister Modi's visit to the U.S. What do you make out of, uh, what is the expectation from his visit to the U.S.? I think people are looking forward very much to having the Prime Minister come. Um, and very honored that it is so early in his coming into office. Uh, my sense is that um, people, especially the President of the United States, are going to be looking for how to really have a partnership with the Prime Minister and with India to deal with all the various issues that are out there internationally, uh, stability of the region, and generally issues to do with energy, trade, uh, a number of issues. So I, I think it's going to be a very important visit. But you know, hasn't the Modi-U.S. relationship gone a long way? You know, first there was a boycott of Modi, and now there's actually a summit between Obama and Modi that's going to take place. Well, I think people want to look forward. Um, and they uh, see Prime Minister Modi as having been elected in a very uh, vibrant way by the world's largest democracy. We have an awful lot of things that we want to talk to uh, him personally and, and India about. So I think it's a desire to look forward and really look at how to make this relationship one of the key ones uh, that the United States has and, and hopes very much that India sees it the same way. Do you see the one-on-one -on -one summit as a special message for India? You know, uh, why is Obama single Modi out for this one-on-one -on -one after the UN meet? Well, I, I think that uh, it is a sign. I mean, there are many, many leaders coming to the United States. And one of the ways that a president of the United States points out when there are scores of leaders there with whom he's going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. So I do think it's a very important message. And in terms of, you know, there are a lot of issues regarding trade and, uh, you know, migration issues with the U.S. Would these kind of issues come up or would it be a broader picture talk? I, I presume, I don't know, but I presume it will be a broader picture in terms of uh, all the issues that we have uh, between us, uh, mostly, uh, I think, looking at the positive aspects of how our relationship can evolve. I do know that the United States uh, wants to have partners uh, in dealing with some of the international issues, obviously stability issues, peace, but also the larger issues, um, climate change, energy issues. Um, so I think that they'll, they certainly will have an awful lot to talk about. And does the China play as a factor in the uh, warm relations between India and U.S.? I think that the warm relations are based on uh, the bilateral relationship. But obviously, um, people are interested in uh, a number of other relationships that we all have. And President Xi Jinping will have been in India before the Prime Minister comes to the United States. And, and uh, from my own understanding of how things work, I'm sure that the President will be interested in the Prime Minister's views on Xi Jinping and China generally. You know, recently Modi went to Japan and he spoke about uh, against uh, countries with expansionist tendencies. Who do you think he was referring to? I imagine and I hope he was referring to President Putin. And not the Chinese Premier? Uh, well, I, I, uh, I don't know, you know, but I think that uh, at the moment we are, at least in the United States, looking very much at the kind of things that President Putin has been doing. Uh, and the president had a lot of that on his mind. Uh, I don't. I imagine that um, the prime minister had a, uh, a full conversation with Prime Minister Abe, uh, because there are a lot of issues, as I read about, that they uh, need to talk about that they have in common. And also, Modi, you know, about our prime minister, he's uh, begun with this neighbors first policy, which is consolidate your neighbors, South Asia, and then move on. You know, he's finishing with South Asia first, meeting the heads before going off to the U.S. As a strategy, how do you see it? I think it's a very smart strategy. I think we were 
very encouraged when he had the SARC uh, leaders here, when he invited a number of uh, people, including the neighbor, to his uh, inauguration. Message. I think that uh, normally, as somebody that was a diplomat, I think it's important to kind of anchor your region uh, and then be able to look at the wider area. So um, I think it was a smart thing to do. But clearly, the prime minister uh, is uh, ranging more widely. I think his trip uh, to Japan, and then the fact that Xi Jinping is coming here, and that he's coming to the United States. And it'll be very interesting, as somebody, I was ambassador at the United Nations, to okay. see uh, how the Prime Minister sees the United Nations, and his General Assembly speech, and all the various issues that India uh, may want to deal with with others. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, can India spearhead, uh, say, a South Asian bloc on the uh, lines of, say, the European Union? I think that's what we want to make a power bloc. Does that make sense to you? And can we do it? I, I think that there are generally questions. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, can India spearhead, uh, say, a South Asian bloc on the uh, lines of, say, the European Union? I think that's what we want to make a power bloc. Does that make sense to you? And can we do it? I, I think that there are generally questions about how um, regional unions work. Mm. Um, clearly, the Europeans been, have been having some problems. Um, there are questions about how customs work, uh, uh, how um, regional organizations work. What I, I am a political scientist, and so mm. what is interesting is to see how regional groupings come together in terms of a larger multilateral international grouping. But I think regional groupings are important in terms of trying to find common values uh, and trying to solidify. But uh, each one is a little bit different, frankly. Which brings me to my next question. Of the two, Japan and China, which makes a better ally for India? Well, I think India has to decide that. You know, one of the but things... But as an observer from the sidelines. Well, I, I think that they're different, uh, very mm. different in terms of their relationship. I mean, obviously, China, as a, a huge country uh, with a population and a growth rate, uh, that there's always some competition. Uh, and Japan has been a, a major power um, and is also has a lot of economic issues that they want to deal with. But they're very different. and. Uh, what I have found interesting, hmm. and, and all I know uh, is what I have read, is the similarity in some of the economic views uh, that India has with Japan that are a little bit different than uh, they might with China. And also, I guess, because Japan is, uh, represents a friendlier country than China, we don't, we don't have the border issues the way we have with China. Well, I, I, I do think that one of the last things that hmm. an American wants to do or should do is talk about how a great country such as India should relate to its neighbors. Well, fair enough on that one. But uh, moving on, what about uh, your visit here? What brings you here? Well, I, I try to come fairly regularly. I used to come uh, as a public official. Hmm. I am here now because I have a global consulting firm, and we have a lot of... That is uh, Albright Stone Edge. Albright Stonebridge Group. And one of the things that we try to do is to help our clients uh, in, in, well, we made up a term called commercial diplomacy right. to really be helpful because we think it's a win-win situation when multinational corporations are able to uh, operate within a country such as India that has a, uh, a huge uh, uh, market and uh, a fascinating population and, and a good way to, to establish good relations. One of the things that I have felt uh, since I've been out of office hmm. is the capabilities of businesses to be able to help in uh, relations generally, people-to-people -people relations, uh, understanding what we have in common, and something that fascinates me are public-private partnerships. So there are any number of reasons. I have had a terrific visit here uh, in terms of meeting with some government officials, some opposition people, uh, think tanks, so I, I have learned a lot on this trip. But this is your first trip here since we've had a government change. What, have you noticed anything different in the way of people are working, the atmosphere here? I think that from my sense, again, from mm. talking to people, is that there is a sense of excitement. Uh, there are some who wonder why things haven't happened faster and some who think that things are happening the right pace. Uh, but there is a sense that things are, are different. Uh, and some uh, of uh, the people I've spoken to uh, are trying to get used to it. But mm. I think there is a sense of excitement. And I personally 
uh, felt excitement in that I could come here and say that uh, Americans are looking forward to having the Prime Minister come and to have these kinds of meetings that he's having with the President and then with our business community. Uh, I think that, as I understand it, the Prime Minister is going to meet uh, with business uh, leaders uh, and then also how he likes New York. So uh, I think it'll be a good visit. But what is the message that you give to your investors about India currently? What was the advice? What are the good points and what are the drawbacks? Well, I think that uh, I happen to believe that there are huge opportunities here. Uh, but I do think that people need to understand that the new government is trying to um, get its feet on the ground mm. and trying to figure out who does what. Um, to look at some um, legislation that um, needs to be uh, changed uh, to make... I mean, my sense is that the Indians do want to have foreign investment, and the question is how to make it work. Hmm. Uh, in any country, it's not a simple issue, uh, but um, mostly I think people need to get to know the new government, and the new government has to sort out how it's going to operate. So I'm very glad I came when I did, uh, I hope to be able to explain things better uh, when I get back to the United States. And, uh, and uh, I hope very much that the Prime Minister's visit is as successful as I think it will be. You've also been speaking in favor of increasing the FDI in, in, FDI in insurance, which is the move that this government has taken. Uh, how will that help India? I think that generally, if I, if I might put it this way, is that uh, adjustments in laws that provide a certain amount of regularity and predictability is what is needed for um, foreign investment. And that sometimes investors are discouraged uh, when they can't figure out uh, what the law is or why it takes so long. And so I, I happen to believe generally in foreign investment um, and that if the rules are the such that investors understand, mm -hmm. it is a win-win proposition. And one of the things I learned as a diplomat, and I now know as a businesswoman, it is better to have win-win than zero-sum. And so I think that having a capability of uh, having a parliament and legislation and the states operating in a way that is understandable to foreign investors helps India. But uh, what about the mayor? Under Manmohan Singh, did, uh, did not that such a message of clarity come out? Uh, I think that there were times that it was a little complicated, and uh, um, and I think, and I have been doing business here for some time now, and part of the thing in this way of doing commercial diplomacy is trying to explain to the people that mm. you represent, as well as to the government where you are and the people where you are trying to do business, is how to make it better. And so um, I think in many ways, um, I have been doing a lot of reading about the first hundred days. Uh, there have been expectations, right. uh, and I think some of them have to do with uh, whether it will be a more kind of welcoming environment. That would be uh, the way that a lot of foreigners see it. Good. And uh, getting back to the U.S., you know, we heard President Obama give a, lay out his strategy how to counter ISIS. What do you make of that? I think it was a very important speech. I uh, heard it while I was here. Mm. Um, and the president has made clear that ISIS is a barbaric system that, in fact, cannot be tolerated by um, people that have values where we value individual life, that if this is going to be something that has to be dealt with internationally that it isn't just a threat to Americans um, or to the region, but, but it is a general threat. And so I think that the president, this is very much on his mind. I presume that he will also be discussing this with the prime minister. Uh, with Prime Minister Modi, ISIS will come up. I, I, I'm sure it will, uh, because it's very much um, uh, in the news and on the president's mind. And generally, I would like to say about President Obama that mm. what he is dedicated to is finding partners with similar values to be able to work on issues of stability, safety, peace, so that we can all operate in a way that our people are not frightened and not afraid of a, of a group of people who have nothing that they want to do beyond terrorize everybody. So uh, this is not just an American issue, it's an international issue. Uh, and uh, I think that is the way that the president stated it. 
you know, Al Qaeda is also opening a branch in India. They have also, you know, trying to recruit people from here. So, what? Uh, how should we handle it? Um, I think that uh, we generally see this as a problem uh, that, uh, again, that has been stated not only by President Obama but by Prime Minister Cameron generally about the recruitment issue. Thank you very, very much for. Okay, no, I just have one last question. You know, to quote you, you once said that jewelry and pins have been worn throughout history as symbols of power. What do you think of Modi's accessories? He speaks in Hindi, for instance. He has this kurta that he's made a style of his own. How important is style in diplomacy? And well, what do you think I, of him? I do think that people have to feel comfortable representing uh, their uh, culture hmm? or somebody else's, which is why I have an. I see elephant. that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for talking yeah. to us. Thank you very much. The Prime Minister also tends to become a brand ambassador for the country, especially when he or she is travelling abroad. And no one is more aware of this than Prime Minister Modi. For his interactions are always laced with some anecdote that establishes India's culture and ethos. But other Prime Ministers too have done India proud on the global arena. Here is a quick checklist. As Prime Minister, Nehru visited United States three times, meeting President Eisenhower, Truman and finally Kennedy. In fact, it was during his third visit in 1961 when he met John F. Kennedy that Nehru got to showcase both his charm and soft diplomacy. The Kennedys met Nehru and Indira Gandhi at the airport and the visit was a whirlwind of dinners, bilateral talks and media interactions. I must say, it is a slightly intimidating um, experience to meet so many of uh, members of the press who whose uh, words not only go across the United States but to all parts of the world. As the acknowledged leader of the neutralist bloc of nations, what is your opinion of the continued nuclear blasting by the USSR? Well, the answer is there is no neutralist bloc. Secondly, I'm not the leader of anybody, if you like. My people have done me the honor of, uh, of uh, putting me in a very responsible position in India, so I can claim to speak on behalf of India, but not of any, on behalf of any other country. I don't presume to be leader of any other, and I have no desire to be leader of any other country. My desire is to cooperate with them, certainly try to influence them sometimes, according to my thinking. As for the, the resumption of nuclear tests by the Soviet Union, I've often stated that I've thought it uh, uh, a very harmful, disastrous thing. For a variety of reasons, apart from the harm it actually causes, it uh, brings about a war psychosis. This question follows, uh, do you think you can deal with Russia and the U.S. on the same moral plane? It doesn't deal with countries, one deals with problems. So we can't answer uh, a question like this about a country being dealt with on a moral plane. It's the action of a country that may be considered, you may agree or disagree with it. Interestingly, Nehru also took time to visit the famous Disneyland in California, where he rode in an electric car with Walt Disney. This visit took place, interestingly, two days before Nehru's 72nd birthday. During the Cold War, India's relationship with Russia was always a factor in the Indo-US relations, while India has always been suspicious of America's support to Pakistan, but it was during Indira Gandhi's time that the relations plummeted to an all-time low, especially during the 1971 Indo-Pak War. As Henry Kissinger was to say later, the blunt military chiefs of Pakistan were more congenial to Nixon than the complex and apparently haughty Brahmin leaders of India. However, Indira's son Rajiv managed to charm the United States back. His youth and boyish charm were there on full display when he met with Ronald Reagan. India is an old country, but a young nation. And like the young everywhere, we are impatient. I am young, and I too have a dream. I dream of an India strong, independent, self-reliant, and on the front rank of the nations of the world in the service of mankind. I am committed to realizing that dream through dedication, hard work, and the collective determination of our people. Rajiv used the bridge of information and technology to create a working rapport between the two countries. 
Moreover, his public school background and political lineage were important accessories in his charm offensive. What we were both looking for was a much more democratic international environment. We were not looking to build blocks to challenge others or to strengthen this block and be one versus another because we felt that that was not the way civilization should move. I find him a very open man, very forthcoming, a much more international experience than his predecessor. I feel that we can get a lot done uh, for not only the US and India, but for reducing global tensions and moving things in a proper direction. Where Rajiv brought the energy of youth, Atal Bihari Vajpayee brought to the negotiating table the gravitas of a seasoned campaigner. His words were more measured than spontaneous in his dealings with the then President Bill Clinton. Vajpayee too spoke of trade between two countries. Prime Minister Vajpayee, America always has had a great fascination with India for its rich history, culture, great religions. And increasingly, we are fascinated by India when we think in terms of always has had a great fascination with India for its rich history, culture, great religions. And increasingly, we are fascinated by India when we think in terms of the future. Our dialogue will embrace economic cooperation, science, technology, as well as in-depth discussion on regional and global issues. I pay tribute to the Indian-American community, which has been such an effective bridge in strengthening Indo-U.S. ties. But more importantly, Vajpayee was going to the U.S. post the 1998 nuclear test. He managed the fine art of allaying concerns about an India post the nuclear test, but also conveyed in blunt terms India's commitment to a stable and secure Southeast Asia. His aides say that he joked to Clinton that while he had taken the bus to Lahore, the bus went to Kargil. Vajpayee also addressed the UN in Hindi, and though Modi has gone a step further and is now conducting all his global interactions in Hindi. विकास के लिए राष्ट्रों के बीच शांति और लोकतंत्र की स्थापना आवश्यक है शांति लोकतंत्र और विकास एक दूसरे के पूरक हैं यह खेद का विषय है कि विश्व की शांति और सुरक्षा के लिए परमाणु युद्ध का भय इस नई सदी में भी एक गंभीर खतरा बना हुआ है Manmohan had the added value of brand recall. The West already knew him before he became Prime Minister as the great liberalizer. But it was not economic reforms, but the nuclear deal that was the highlight of Indo-US relations in the Manmohan era. In making all this happen, you have referred to our cooperation with regard to civil nuclear energy. I know these were difficult issues and at each stage it was your leadership, your personal intervention, which resolved all the difficulties that were affecting the progress of these ne negotiations. One, one such sign of that relationship is the India-U.S. Civilian Nuclear Agreement. It's taken a lot of work on both our parts, a lot of courage on your part, and of course we want the agreement to satisfy you and come get out of our Congress. The personal Bonhomi between Bush and Manmohan was there for all to see. In fact, this rap had critics complaining that the Indian Prime Minister was going out of his way to accommodate the West. This kind of personal bond was missing from the Obama-Manmohan meetings, however. And now it is time for the Obama-Modi meeting. Modi's U.S. visit will be a high-profile one. Apart from addressing the UN General Assembly meeting, he is also invited to a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Obama in Washington. Coming as it does after the US boycott of Modi, this invitation is significant. All eyes on Modi's big ticket visit to the US. While it is difficult to predict someone like Modi, we do have a hint of his soft diplomacy skills mixed with hard talk as showcased during his visits to South Asia and Japan.
For instance, he's always quick to strike a personal rapport with the host country, whether it is reuniting a boy with his parents as he did in Nepal, or finding a common cultural link as he did in Japan. He also rarely fails to talk about the Gujarat model when hard-selling India as an investment destination, and his pet phrase, red carpet, not red tape, that was first coined in Gujarat, is now being repeated all over South Asia, and this could find an echo in the US as well. But definitely all eyes will be on Narendra Modi as he addresses the United Nations General Assembly. For no doubt, the Indian Prime Minister has become quite the global fascination. But from us, that's all this week. Thank you for watching Cover Story and we'll see you again same time next week.